Vogliamo dunque accogliere Karen Coonrod. Sono molto grato per la sua presenza, colpito da, dalla fiducia che ha avuto nell'amicizia di Cecil di aver accettato di fare questo salto nell'incognito. Vorrei ringraziare uh, tutti qui e tutti voi e um, Jean-Marie e la Fondazione Stabat per l'occasione di parlare qui. Um, ok. Adesso parlerò in inglese. <laughs> As a director in the theater, I start from looking at the word on the page. The challenge is how to put that word into space. I'm not going to describe that space right now. It could be the theater stage or it could be the countless alternate spaces or somewhere in the imagination. And I'm going to begin with an example that doesn't even have a typical narrative structure. It's not a Shakespeare play. It's not a living room drama. Rather, it's a poem. And this presents a very interesting question of how to embody these verses into space. The poem is Walt Whitman's Song of Myself, made in 1855 when he was 36 years old, I have to say, uh, which Compagnia de Colombari recently performed as part of the 200th anniversary of his birth all around New York City in May. Uh, let me show you a clip and then I'll speak about it. The pure contralto sings in the organ loft. The carpenter dresses his plank. The tongue of his foreplane whistles its wild ascending lisp. The married and unmarried children ride home to their Thanksgiving dinner. The pilot seizes the kingpin. He heaves down with a strong arm. The mate stands braced in the whale boat, lance and harpoon are ready. The duck shooter walks by silent and cautious stretches. The deacons are ordained with cross hands at the altar. The spinning girl retreats and advances to the hum of the big wheel. The farmer stops by the bars of a Sunday and looks at the oats and rye. The lunatic is carried at last to the asylum, a confirmed case. He will never sleep anymore as he did in a cot in his mother's bedroom. The sure printer, with gray head and gaunt jaws, works at his case. He turns his quid of tobacco. His eyes get blurred with the manuscript. The malformed limbs are tied to the anatomist's table. What is removed drops horribly into a pill. The bride unrumples her white dress. The minute hand of the clock moves slowly. The opium eater with rigid head reclines with just opened lips. The prostitute draggles her shawl. Her bonnet bobs on her tipsy and pimpled neck. The crowd laugh at her blackguard oath. The men jeer and weep to each other. Miserable! I do not laugh at your oaths nor jeer you. The president holds a cabinet council. He is surrounded by the great secretary. On the piazza walk five friendly matrons with twine darts. The crew of the fish smack pack repeated layers of halibut in the hole. The quadroon girl is towed at the stand. 
Oh. The drunkard nods by the barroom The door. machinist rolls up his sleeve. The policeman travels his beat. The gatekeeper marks who passed. The young fellow drives the express wagon. I love him, though I do not know him. I love him, though I do not know I him. I love him, though I do not know I him. I love him, though I do not I know him. I love him, though I do not know him. He sleeps and the country sleeps. The living sleep for their time. The dead sleep for their time. husband sleeps by his wife, and the young husband sleeps by his wife, and these one and all tend inward to me, and I tend outward. Such as it is to be of these, more or less, I am. We can show the next picture. Um, this passage from Whitman is an invitation to all. Here he has written a very long list of different people in various occupations from all corners of the world, different uh, of America, different types, crazy and sane, black and white, leaders and followers, everybody all across America in 1855. I wanted to make that list come alive to make evident that the individuality is enhanced by the community and also to sculpt what and who stands out. So I asked each actor delivering the one line about their character to accompany it with a gesture as if creating a little painting with their bodies. It was important to position them side by side, thus slamming together all the different types of people in America of the 1850s. While the tempo gets faster and faster until the remarkable line, the young fellow drives the express wagon I love him, though I do not know him. When I read that uh, on, the, on the page, I said, we have to repeat that line, because that is the heart of what Whitman is saying. The young, the, so I, I asked all the actors to repeat the phrase as an echo, I love him, though I do not know him. Getting to the heart of Whitman, to his observation of the other. Everything he is saying in this section 
of the poem culminates in this love for someone he does not know. And this stood out for me, and I played with that in the performance, asking each actor to repeat the phrase, thus letting it ripple like waves in the audience's ear while the music is behind. The surprise and beauty of the sentiment was clearly central in Whitman's thought, and it was important for me to catch it in the performance. It became a distended moment, prophetic even, in urgency. Whitman's poem, The Great is the Great American Poem, that celebrates individuality and sings the ensemble. In America, we have understood and cornered the market on individualism, but still have much to do and to learn about the collective or the community. And Whitman is still ahead of us. After this line is spoken in the piece, there is a guitar solo as if in response to all this gathering of humanity, which leads to an understanding for all men and women in the world in this moment. And these one and all tend inward to me, and I tend outward to them, and such as it is to be of these, more or less, I am. It's also witty. This became our title song, More or Less I Am, and also an expression of the poet's presence at the center, omniscient in observation of mankind, and this was actually radical in 1855 in America, thus privileging the freedom of the poet, the artist, to act as astute observer and perhaps a force of reconciliation. And we were performing that, by the way, um, on his 200th birthday, so it was very special. The poem is not a narrative in the way that often the theater celebrates, where the audience suspends belief and watches characters in a flurry of activity. Rather, Song of Myself begins with the pronoun I and ends with the pronoun you. An open-ended poem that in the theater lands with the you of the audience. So the invitation is direct from the players to the audience. It is like an extended aside in Shakespeare in which a character engages directly with the audience to enlist support and challenge. But with this piece, the I is very fluid, moving from actor to actor and sometimes all five taking on the collective I. In this interesting moment of the fluidity of identity in the world, uh, it is an exhilarating thing to accomplish on stage. And very old-fashioned, I have to say, too. (laughs) Whitman called his poem a song, Song of Myself. Thus, the necessity of music I invited musicians, Colin Jacobson, Kyle Sanna, therefore, Eric Jacobson, and Alex Sopp, to compose music in response to the poetry. Sometimes played underneath the text, sometimes in solo response to the words, sometimes attached to the words in singing, and sometimes without music, in silence, also an important part of music. In our theater piece, 
The music adds critical texture, allowing the words to be experienced viscerally. In the clip you saw, the guitarist plays his response to the catalog of people and then leads us all to the great leveling sleep of humankind. Another line of importance in Whitman's Song of Myself is this. What is known, I strip away. I launch all men and women forward with me into the unknown. I love this. When we spoke it in the piece, it was delivered by a child, without music, in a challenge, an invitation to all to be brave. I offer it here because I think it goes deep into the belief system that we must have as artists, makers of theater. It's like an artist's mantra. We must be bold. We must go into what is unknown in order to make room for surprising epiphanies, tapping what is larger than all of us. If we stick to the old formulae, to what we know, and dutifully repeat what has been successful in the past, we are missing great opportunities to make huge leaps into wondrous new worlds. When I use the word mining, I am talking about digging, excavating deeply, wildly beyond our imaginings. The word is the carrier of meaning. In a culture, we agree on these meanings. But words are always ripe for more meaning and we, than we usually attribute to them. Space is the realm in which the action takes place, the theater which is essentially ephemeral, can mine an eternal moment. And in one way, of all the arts, it is the most theologically correct because the aim is a shared ownership in time. It is not an object to be possessed to occupy space, but rather a shared moment in time, changing one forever. In the immediacy of the theater, we are always looking for the largest resonance written on the heart. However, the theater also needs its space for this moment to occur. I'm sitting here now talking with you in this room the theater has to be configured in some specific way for the players to confront its audience. And it is that configuration, informed by the words spoken by the actors, that can begin to tap the visceral quality of the words and take all to a new place together. Okay, well, another photo. When I worked on the medieval mystery plays with their cosmic trajectory, Strangers and Other Angels uh, was the name of our piece. We traversed the streets of Orvieto, Italy, thus taking the theater outside the institution, outside the church, outside of the theater, right into the streets to greet its audience gratis. In one of the plays, the second shepherd's play, the shepherds and all the world come to witness Mary cradling the baby Jesus. And I wanted to find a new way into this image. Since we would be in the middle of a crowded piazza, I did not want the actress playing Mary to cradle a baby or a doll or a piece of cloth, and it could not be static. I asked the question, how could we sculpt the light of the world, 
as Jesus refers to himself in John's Gospel? That really excited me. What is, I didn't know the answer. I had no idea, but started walking around with this question in my head. I'd studied many painters in their portrayals of the nativity. However, what stood out for me were the paintings and drawings of Rembrandt, also Caravaggio, and who showed the light emanating from the arms of Mary. Light was not shining on the baby, but rather the baby was the source of light. So I spoke with Peter Cassander, our lighting designer, and it occurred to us that we could bring Peter right out into the middle of the scene with the light stick, thus not hiding anything, but making, making the moment right in front of the audience so that the light emanates from the cradling arms of Mary rather than the light shining on an object inside the arms. Theologically, this excited me very much, and it created a wild image for all the audience members. The children in the production were completely riveted to this moment. We didn't have to tell them to be still. <laughs> Behind, we see the actress, Trezana Beverly, who played God. She, by the way, is a Tony winner for, for colored girls who considered suicide when the rainbow is not enough. Anyway, but she played God in Orvieto. <laughs> Singing the gospel song, Mary Had a Baby. And if you can imagine with me for a moment, after this moment, because we were moving with this image, there's Peter, the lighting designer, and... Uh, it's Patrice. Patrice from Jamaica played Mary. And we were moving with this image of Mary cradling the light right across the piazza until Patrice, the actress, lets go the light into the world. And Peter holds the light stick right up into the sky to shine. So it was, it was very exciting. It was sort of a case of you had to be there. <laughs> thrilling moment that's um, special and it's also special because it can be read on many different levels it's exciting to just watch if you don't know anything about it and the more you know the more you read and the deeper you go into it and the more you gain from it so it's thrilling and now now I'd like to turn to Shakespeare so we're going to look at another photo I'm turning to Shakespeare and a narrative structure, and this is uh, The Tempest that I did at La Mama Theater in New York City, and this is called The Holy Exercise. We often rehearse four or five weeks before going into the space where we're going to perform, and it is important, I think, to let the space speak to us. So often I do a holy exercise with my actors. In the case of the following example from The Tempest, after the company spent these four weeks rehearsing the play and studying the text, moving in the space, we walked into the theater space of La Mama, and I told them not to be polite or to follow anything we had done in the room previously. You, you know just let it all go. Rather, shake it out. Let the space have its say and completely inform the speaking of the text in the moment. This can become very wild and surprising. And I call it the holy exercise because a new psychological vocabulary is shared, a deep bond is forged, and it is Dionysian. And there are, are various little moments on the screen there. Imagine the actors, a company of 15, just set loose in the space. It's, it's a sort of consecration of the space itself by 
them going there with the words and just going in any corner of the space and finding new moments, new physical moments. Uh, based on all the time that was spent in the rehearsal hall, new bold joy gestures can be made, and the actors are free. A new level of fearlessness that I love, witnessing in the marriage of the words and the new physicality. During this exercise, which takes twice as long as the play itself, I watch and either make drawings or take photographs. These are my <laughs> photographs. As I am now researching their impulses with each other, all drawn from the work on the text in the rehearsal. I steal from their choices and put them in the final performance. Often at the end of the exercise, the actors are either weeping or completely without words. And the next photo. With this exercise for The Tempest, a special wildness was felt by Ariel in relationship to Prospero and everyone in the play. A real loving intimacy between Ferdinand and Miranda and a raucousness between the clowns. And in the end, all the actors and musicians surrounded Prospero, who was human being exhibit A in the play. And Prospero, by the way, was played by Reggie Cathy, who, if you know the TV film House of Cards, he played, he was the African-American man who played who sold the ribs to the president, and he played Prospero. He's no longer with us. He died last year, and we miss him very much. But in the end, Prospero, in the middle, was very beloved because he has to learn forgiveness. And so this was something very special. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to show a clip in a second because a piece of text was very important in The Tempest. Uh, in The Tempest, Ariel, on behalf of everyone non-human, urges Prospero to fulfill what it means to be human. And the text is very little, so I'll read it. Uh, the text struck me in my preparation. Ariel says, Your charm so strangely worksome that if you now beheld them, your affections would become tender. Prospero says, Dost thou think so, spirit? And Ariel says, Mine would, sir, were I human. In this passage, Ariel, the spirit, the representative of all that is not human, challenges Prospero, the most intelligent human of them all. Prospero, who has become eaten up by his desire for revenge, obsessed with getting even with his enemies, with punishment, Prospero has become a tyrant. And in this passage, Ariel says to him that he, he would become tender, that is, kind, compassionate, if he were human. But he's not human. He's a spirit. And yet he sees that Prospero, the human, is not behaving as a human. Thus the spirit challenges Prospero, the intelligent, sophisticated human. The challenge creates a huge conflict that demands more time and space in the theater performance. And for me, it is a turning point. In this moment, Ariel not only challenges him personally, but politically and metaphysically. It is as if he's being challenged for how he has had dominion of all the living beings of the world. And I'm reminded of God's words to Adam and Eve in Genesis, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. 
How has Prospero handled his dominion? He has no tenderness whatsoever. His humanity is gone. When Ariel asks his question of Prospero in my production, all the people of the company enter into the confrontation with Prospero's lack of humanity. The actors line up behind Ariel to create a force of attention, bringing together a solidarity of everything in the world that is not human. Spirit, nature, the invisible world, on how Prospero, how will you answer this challenge, Prospero? The mus musicians, too, are attentive, as if all the world wants to know how Prospero, this chief of men, will answer this burning challenge. What is it to be human? What is the difference between spirit and human? When Ariel says, mine would, sir, were I human. I placed a huge distended silence there so that Prospero thinks inside the silence while they all watch and wait. And then he turns to look at Ariel to say, and mine shall. Prospero has cherished Ariel because he needs the power provided by the spirit. Now let me show you a clip of this moment at La Mama. Confined together in the same fashion as you gave charge, just as you left them all prisoners, sir. They cannot budge till your release. The king, his brother, and yours abide all three distracted, brimful of sorrow and dismay. But chiefly him that you turn, sir, the good old lord Gondalo. His tears run down his beard like winter's drops from eaves of reeds. Your charm so strongly works that if you now help them, your affections would become tender. The sound is so. My wood, sir, were I human. So in this clip, you see where the musicians move in the moment of the spell, when Ariel's eyes are fixed on Prospero for an answer to the challenge. Uh, there, there was always a sense in the play that all the performers are both characters and actors. We are always demanding the complete attention of the audience. I want them to alternate between the suspension of disbelief and back into our reality that shimmers of larger mysteries. Okay, now I want to show a photo of the merchant. I'm going to try to go faster. Um, but the merchant of Venice, to stay with Shakespeare just a little longer, I would like to consider the word mercy in the merchant of Venice. Ah, this is also the tempest. Moments of the Tempest at La Mama. But this is, yeah. Um, see, so The Merchant of Venice. Uh, the play is best known for its two pillar speeches. Um, <laughs> a call for humanity hath not a Jew eyes, 
and a challenge for mercy. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven. The word mercy first appears in the play when Shylock says to Antonio, tell me not of mercy. Venice has never demonstrated mercy until now, this moment, when Antonio, one of their own, is endangered. Now, mercy is required of the Jew. Through the trial of Portia, it is driven home to him with a vengeance. And I need to take you back. I, I'm going to try to say this fast here. Um, I, I involved five actors playing Shylock, uh, because we had the opportunity, Compania di Colombari, to do it in the Jewish ghetto of Venice, Venezia, um, to mark the 500th anniversary of the formation of the ghetto in conjunction with the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death. So these two events created this occasion. And so approaching this Piece, I wanted to, with the Shylock entrance into the ghetto, and of course in the play there is no ghetto, um, but we performed it on the stones of the ghetto, I decided to have one Shylock per scene, thus creating a character that is Jewish and universal and an immigrant and uh, the stranger and the other. Um, Shylock number three was a woman, and the one who speaks the speech hath not a Jew, eyes, hands, and so forth. Um, the pivotal moment happens when Jessica leaves the, fa the father, Shylock, and goes with uh, the political Christians, I call them boys, uh, and the grieving that happens from Shylock is when we did it, slammed the ghetto into silence. It was an extraordinary moment. And so we understood that uh, the grieving of the father, played by a woman, uh, was a wonderful mix so that we could really see that uh, now Judaism does not continue. Now the daughter is gone. Now the beloved wife is, is lost. Um, there's no mercy in this play. And it is for this reason that I ended the play not with the return of the rings as the play ends, but rather with the rerun of Shylock's speech when he first appears at the trial of the Duke. He says, you'll ask me why? I rather choose to have a pound of carrion flesh than to receive 3,000 ducats. I'll not answer that, but say it is my humor. Are you answered? And when the five actors come forward to speak this speech at the end, which is really a, a speech of warning, it's, it's not a nice speech. It's not lovely. It's not a beautiful speech. It's a speech of warning. Um, and each of the five Shylocks says, Are you answered? 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 There's a wake-up call from the shofar, and on the walls of the ghetto, the next photo, the walls of the ghetto are the words mercy. Uh, we can't see it. <laughs> but you, we can't see mercy, it eludes us. But, <laughs> but anyway, the words mercy, and we had it in English, Italian, Hebrew, Rakhamim. Um, interesting, 2016 was also when Pope Francis declared the year Misericordia. So it just all came together um, that what was missing in this play was mercy, but the ghetto walls, the handwriting on the walls of the ghetto looked down on the stage uh, 
beckoning the audience with mercy and asking them to wake up. So, um, the next the next photo is actually I'm not going to talk about it very much. It's it's, it's about Elizabeth the first. It's called Texts and Beheadings. Uh, Elizabeth R. And this was for four women, four actresses, each playing Elizabeth I, who normally wouldn't play her, you see. <laughs> That's part of the fun. But uh, there's, and the next photo perhaps is, uh, I just chose this text, which is, this is a piece that I wrote, but all based on the poems, the speeches, the letters and the prayers of Elizabeth I. A lot of people don't know about the prayers, but she wrote them in many languages, and it's the only time that she took off her crown. <laughs> but she does say, I will never marry. And so there's a little game that I made uh, with all the many wooers. She had about 50 people that asked her to marry her. And so we made a game. There was, it was for four actresses, four scenes, for movements, uh, and four games. And the first game was the wooers dance. And so you see them all playing the wooers, giving her the rose moves around. And she says, no. Ah. But no one believed her that she said that she meant it. So we bring, we tease this and make it and in all the languages, actually. We did it in Spanish. We did it in Swedish. The, the Swedish king asked her to marry her about four times. So anyway, uh, so we go from fierce to absurd to mocking to, uh, to the truth inside the word. Um, the, the last, so we, we stay here for a minute, but I also wanted to show um, another piece that I've done is Flannery O'Connor's Everything That Rises Must Converge, Punto Omega in Italiano. And um, it's a short story, Flannery O'Connor, a writer from the South, which I brought to the stage with the mandate that from the estate that every single word from the story, including he said and she, she said, had to be used. Um, the story is about a mother and a son on a bus in the American South, written in, in early 60s. O'Connor's narration is hilarious, first poking fun at the conservative, racist, gracious Southern mother, then making fun of her son, Julian, the liberal educated in the North, also a racist, but he doesn't know it. In this way, the narration is carnivalesque, dialogic, like Dostoevsky, uh, uh, very, uh, very dialogic. So it is constantly shifting positions and moving freely inside the heads of the white mother and the white son. And it is hilarious when it hits you in the stomach as the read, and as the audience member, it takes you on a wild journey to a new place. Uh, I wanted to bring the, the story into the 21st century of America with a theatrical frame of narrators, black and white, who together become an eschatological company of voices from the other side. So in America, we have a lot of trouble with race, big trouble. Um, it's a big history that very few people understand outside of America. Um, so to put these black and white narrators on the stage together as if an eschatological chorus, as if from the other side, looking at how we live our lives and how and what we've chosen to do is very freeing and remarkable. So from the other side of death, let's say, laughing at what fools these mortals be, together, black and white, sharing this position, not divided anymore. Because I take what is said in Galatians, Ephesians, I can't remember where it is, but it says there is no, <laughs> we are, there's no black, no white, no fem female, no, there's, we're all together, we're all one. So taking that position 
and looking at what we've chosen to do in the American landscape. Um, so in the observation of the mother, all the narrators make fun of the mother, thus siding with Julian, in the misery at having to accompany the mother who has to go on a reducing class to a reducing class because she's overweight. Then the first paragraph of the story ends like this, with Julian's mother and Julian breaking out of character, like sculptures in high relief. Um, actor 8, who plays the white mother, she said, Julian could at least put himself out to take her, considering all she did for him. That's all part of the story. Then, actor 7, Julian says, Julian did not like to consider all she did for him. And then actor 6, who's African-American and the narr lead narrator, but every Wednesday night, he braced himself and took her. So maybe we, we just see this. Do we have, we have time, right, to see this little clip? It's just, um, okay. So oh, that's a, and now the clip. This was, see, aroma doing me doctor had told Julian's mother that she must lose 20 pounds on account of her blood pressure. So on Wednesday nights, Julian had to take her downtown on the bus for a reducing class at the Y. The reducing class was designed for working girls over 50 who weighed from 165 to 200 pounds. His mother was one of the slimmer ones, but she said, ladies, did not tell their age or weight. She would not ride buses by herself at night since they had been integrated. And because the reducing class was one of her few pleasures necessary for her health and free, free. she said Julia could at least put himself out to take her, considering all she did for him. Julia did not like to consider all she did for him. But every Wednesday night, he braced himself and took her. She was almost ready to go, standing before the hall mirror, putting on her hat. While he, his hands behind him, peered came to the door frame, waiting like Saint Sebastian for the arrows to begin piercing him. The hat was new and had cost her seven dollars. And a half. She kept saying, maybe I shouldn't have paid that for it. No, I shouldn't have. I'll take it off and return it tomorrow. I shouldn't have bought it. Julian raised his eyes to heaven. Yes, you should have bought it, he said. Now put it on, let's go. It was a hideous hat. A purple velvet flap came down on one side of it and stood up on the other. The rest of it was green and looked like a cushion with the stuffing on. He decided it was less comical than charming. And pathetic. Everything that gave her pleasure was small and depressed him. She lifted the hat one more time, and, and set it down slowly on top of her head. Two wings of gray hair protruded on either side of her florid face. But her eyes, sky blue, were as innocent and untouched by experience as they must have been when she was ten. Were it not that she was a widow who had struggled this day to feed and clothe and put him through school, and who was supporting him still. Until he got on his feet. She might have been a little girl that he had to take to town. It's all right. It's all right, he said, let's go. He opened the door himself and started down the walk to get her going. The sky was a dying night, and the houses stood out darkly against the bulbous, liver colored monstrosities of a uniform ugliness. So no two were alike. Since this had been a fashionable neighborhood 40 years ago, his mother persisted in thinking. They did well to have an apartment in it. Each house had a narrow collar of dirt around it, in which sat usually a grubby child. Julian walked with his hands in his pockets, his head.
head down and thrust forward. And his eyes glazed with the determination to make himself completely numb during the time he would be sacrificed to her pleasure. The door closed. And he turned to find the dumpy figure surmounted by the atrocious hat coming toward him. Well, she said, you only live once and paid a little more for it. I at least won't meet myself coming and going. Someday I'll stop making money. Julian said gloomily. He knew he never would. You can have one of those jokes whenever you take the fit. She held him firmly by the okay. At that See, moment, I... he put his hands over his face and peeked at Julian's mother through his fingers. So, <clears throat> yeah, later in the story, so the narrators, white and black, make fun of Julian's apparent freedom from racism. They get inside his head as he wants to prove that he can sit next to a black man on the bus. And this escalates until the story drives to its finish with a confrontation between the two women on the bus, one black, one white, who wear the same extravagant purple and blue hat. Purple and green, actually. <laughs> it is then that Julian delivers a diatribe to his mother when the white mother offers the black boy a penny. He says, I told you not to do that. The white mother has been struck by the black mother physically. The white mother, in this disorientation, begins to walk home. And I can hear the click of her heels with the handbag dropping and the hat coming off. And it's Julian, however, who kills her with his hateful words. So it's a generational, it becomes a story about a generational kind of rage, which is also raging in America right now. And then the sharp knife of conviction and the beginning of silence with Julian at the end of the story. How to do something that one could easily imagine on film, on the stage. And things, things come in dreams, and I think this one did too. I saw Julian's mother walking in wide circles in silence, only muttering, home while Julian holds court at the center with his certitude, that sort of, I told you so, I knew it, I told you so, that certainty. The other narrators clear the stage, because this is a, it's an interesting moment for this cosmic arena when somebody decides, I am going to, I'm going to do this, I'm going to say this, I'm going to have my way, this kind of a wrath that comes out. Um, I told you not to do that until he kills her. Flannery O'Connor is extraordinary because she goes all the way. All the way. It's fierce. And only when it is too late will Julian say, Mama, for the first time, and it's too late. So we hear that in the story. Now, we can show this little clip, and then, yeah. This is at the end of being on the bus, again in Rome. She said, and put my hands in front of her face, and peeked at you. The woman slapped his hand down. Quit your foolishness. Jesus, oh, I'm not the Jesus, you? <laughs> Julian was thankful the next stop was theirs. He reached up and pulled the cord. And the woman reached up and pulled it at the same time. Oh, my God. He had a terrible intuition that when they got off the bus together, his mother would reach into her purse and give the little boy a nickel. The gesture would be as natural to her as breathing. The bus stopped. <laughs> The woman got up, lunged to the front, dragging the child who wished to remain on after her. Julian and his mother got up and followed. As they neared the door, Julian tried to relieve her of her pocketbook. No, she murmured. I want 
to give the little boy a nickel. No, you do this. No. She smiled down at the child and opened her bag. The bus door opened. The woman picked him up by the arm and descended with him hanging at her hip. Once in the fruit, she set him down and shook him. Julian's mother had to close her purse while she got down the bus step. But as soon as her feet were on the ground, she opened it again and began to rummage inside. I can't find but a pennant, she whispered. But it looks like a new one. Don't do it, Julian said fiercely between his teeth. There was a sweet eye on the corner. She hurried under it so that she could see better into our pocketbook. The woman was heading off rapidly down the street, the child still hanging backward on her hand. Oh, little boy! Julian's mother called and took a few quick steps and caught up with them just beyond the lamppost. Here's a brand new penny for you. She held out the coin, which shone bronze in the dim light. The huge woman turned, and for a moment stood, her shoulders lifted, her face frozen with frustrated rage, and stared at Julian's mother. All at once, she seemed to explode. Like a piece of machinery who had been given one ounce of pressure too much. Julian saw the black fist swing out with the red pocket. Oh! Oh! He shut his eyes and grinned as he heard the woman shout. He don't take it! No backwards! Sat on the sidewalk. I told you not to do that. Julian said angrily, I told you not to do that! He stood over her for a minute, gritting his teeth. Her legs were stretched out in front of her, and her hat was on her lap. He squatted down and looked her in the face. Totally expressionless. You got exactly what you deserved, he said. Now get out! He picked up a pocketbook, put what had fallen out back in it, picked the hat up off the lap. A penny caught his eye on the sidewalk. And he picked that up and let it drop before her eyes into the purse. Then he stood up, leaned over, and held out his hand to pull her up. Remained immobile. He sighed. Rising above them on either side were black apartment buildings marked with an irregular rectangle of light. But the block of man came out of the doorway and walked off in the opposite direction. All right, he said. Suppose somebody happens by and wants to know why you're sitting on the sidewalk. He took the hand and, breathing hard, pulled heavily up on it. And then stood for a minute, swaying slightly as if the spots of light and darkness were circling around her. Her eyes, shattered and confused, finally settled on his face. He did not try to conceal his irritation. I hope this teaches you a lesson, he said. She leaned forward, and her eyes raised his face. He seemed trying to determine his identity. Then, as if she found familiar about him, she started off with a head-on movement in the wrong direction. Aren't you going on to the Y, he asked? Oh, she muttered. Well, are we walking? For answer, she kept going. Julian followed along, his hands behind him. He saw no reason for the lesson she could have go without backing it up with an explanation of its meaning. She might as well be made to understand what had happened to her. Don't think that was just an uppity Negro woman, he said. That was the whole colored race, which will no longer take your condescending pennies. That was your black double, he said. She could wear the same hat as you, and to be sure, he added intuitively because he thought it was funny, it looked better on her than it did on you. What all this means, he said, is that the old world is gone. The old man is obsolete, and your graciousness is not worth a damn. He thought bitterly of the house that he had bought for him. You are who you think you are, he said. He plowed ahead, paying no attention to him. 
A hand from our dog on side. Dropped a pocketbook, took no notice. He stooped and picked it up. Handed him out to her. But she did not take it. Now on, you gotta live in a new world. Face a few realities for a change. Buck up, you say. It won't kill you. She was breathing fast. Let's wait on a bus, he said. Oh, he said thickly. I hate to see you behave like this. He said, just like a child. I should be able to expect more of him. He said to stop where he was and make her stop and wait on the bus. I'm not going any farther, he said, stopping. We are going on the bus. She continued on as if she'd not heard. He took a few steps and caught on and stopped her. Look. He looked into her face and caught his breath. He was looking into a face he had never seen before. Tell us where that woman from again, she said. He stared stricken. Tell us to hurry up. She said, stunned, he let her go. And she lurched forward again, walking as if one leg were shorter than the other. A tide of darkness seemed to be sweeping her from him. He cried, Stop, sweetheart, wait. Crumpling, she fell to the pavement. He dashed forward, all the other side. Mama! Mama! She turned her over. Her face was fiercely distorted. One eye, large and staring, moved slightly to the left as if it had become a Although remained fixed on him, gripped his face again, found nothing as his own. Quickly, he, he, he cried and jumped up and began to run for help toward a cluster of lights he saw in the distance ahead of him. He shouted. The tide of darkness seemed to sweep him back to her, postponing from moment to moment his entry into the world of guilt and sorrow. of both the son and the mother but eventually we have all killed the mother with our moral certitude and the play enters a dangerous zone where we play for keeps we are all implicated my engagement with an audience always demands of them to be partners in the making of the theater piece I believe the more they put into it the more they get out of it. I want the words in the space to be heard in ways that are new and surprising. I want to sculpt the attention of the audience and together go to places we've never been before. An ephemeral moment in the theater can be mined for an eternal moment. And if it all works right, then there is a sense, too, in which the strangers in the audience become community. Thank you.